I, I just warned Pete that he's in trouble. Um, so I give him warning. Now, obviously, my voice is shot because I was cheering for the Chiefs so much. And I will, and I will even take partial responsibility for their win. Okay? No, seriously. I had a hand in the Kansas City Chiefs winning. Their starting left guard. Anybody know his name? Number 61. Stefan Wisniewski. His dad, Leo, played for the Colts. His, his uncle, Steve, played for the Raiders. When Leo retired, he was an intern for me at my church in Pittsburgh. I baptized Stefan, which made him the man he is today. <laughs> so, you should have asked me who's going to win. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Stefan doesn't remember who I am, but that's okay. All right, so yeah, no, seriously, about halfway through the second sermon on Sunday, this started happening. I have no idea why. Uh, either God wanted me to shut up or Satan did, and I did, wasn't sure which one, so I just kept going. Um, so uh, you're going to have to listen to somebody who sounds like a dead frog going through puberty. That's about what it feels like. So, you know, Pete, Pete asked me, he said, you know, can you talk about leadership, you know, in, in the family, leading your wife, leading your kids? Uh, so, you know, I, I did the wise thing. I asked my wife, okay, and I'm serious. I said, so how am I doing? You know, I, I got to do this talk about leadership in the family. What do I do well? What do I not do so well? Okay. And at first, you know, it might sound like to some guys, sound like, well, that, you know, that's just a cop out. You're asking your wife. How many of you here have ever gone through a 360 review at work? Look at that, like half of you have gone through a review where you've asked your boss, your peers, and the people who report to you to tell you how you're doing. What is more important, how you are doing at work or how you're doing in your family as a leader? Okay? So why not do a 360 review with your family? You know why not? Because we're scared. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, you don't like doing them at work either, do you? but you got it, they make you do it, right? Why not also do it with your family? And I don't care where you are at what stage of life with your family, because you can always get better at what you do as a leader. You should always be getting better at what you do as a leader. And one of the ways you do that is you ask other people, how am I doing? Because, you know, as the scripture said, the heart is a very deceitful thing. You know, and we can fool ourselves into all kinds of stuff. You know, we can fool ourselves into believing we're doing great. We can also kind of guilt ourselves into thinking we're doing terrible and never improve because, we get, because the, the enemy gets us in this position of, of feeling like God can never use you. You're no good. Who do you think you are? You know, how many of you, as your kids were growing up, felt like, man, I, how do I talk to my kids about not getting high? Because what if they ask, Daddy, <laughs> did you? Yes, but I quit when I was 15, okay? Now, that's a true story. <laughs> I was a mess before Jesus. I'm just slightly less a mess now. But we're afraid to, to admit where we've gone wrong, where we've, where we've messed up. Because we've got this thing within us that, oh, you've got to be perfect. Well, you're not going to be perfect until Jesus comes back, all right? So in the meantime, it's about continuing to become more like him. And part of that is looking at saying, well, where am I not like him? And how can I improve? And part of that is owning the areas where we have fallen short and allowing the gospel to speak to that and allowing other people to be able to see, hey, God can do something in my life too. If you've become who you are because of Jesus, maybe Jesus can do the right things in my life. So be willing to ask the questions. How am I doing? Where am I doing well? What am I not doing so well at? And so I did that. I, you know, I took some time and my wife and I talked about that. And, you know, and it was because we've had conversations like this before, there wasn't anything new, but it was reminders for me. You know, this, is, this is what it means. This is what it's like you know, to, be, um, to be a leader in my family, okay? which is more important than in my job or in the church or whatever. You know, and, and those of you who are involved in ministry as a vocation, let me just say this. Your family is way more important than your ministry, okay? 
God can get you another ministry. He doesn't want to get you another wife or family. Okay? And sometimes we mess that up. We think, oh, my relationship with God is dependent on my ministry. No, that's like way down the list. Okay? Way up on the list is your relationship with him, then your relationship with your family. Somewhere down the road is job, ministry, whatever it might be. Okay? So I want to, I want to dig into a passage here that is going to be, I think, fairly familiar. It used to be more familiar until we stopped reading it at weddings and now only read 1 Corinthians 13 because it's all about love. You know. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word and that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. All right, now look at your Bibles again. Do you have another little heading there that says something like children and parents? Yes. Scratch that out. <laughs> Paul never wrote that. How many of you now have a big number six for the start of chapter six? Scratch that out too. Paul never wrote that. Because as soon as we see a new chapter, what do we think? New topic. It's not a new topic. Because what he does now is he goes on to talk about how, parents, how fathers and children actually submit to one another and how masters and slaves submit to one another. Chapter 6 should actually not start until you get down to the whole armor of God. That's a new topic. Okay? Just a little key for you. Sometimes when you're reading your Bible, the chapter and verse headings do not help you they actually cause a problem. And I think what's caused a problem here is we dive into th this whole thing about submission and wives and husbands without realizing that Paul's been talking about submission to one another all the way along. All right, so now here's the question. What does that look like? What's it mean to be able to actually submit to one another? And I'm probably supposed to be putting slides up here, aren't I? Who submits to who? Okay. So we're seeing, Paul's talking here about we all submit to one another. Everybody does on one level or another. But here's the thing about submission that we need to understand. There's two types of submission. One is what we usually try to apply to all these passages. And that is submitting to someone in authority over you simply because they're in authority. You do this at work. Your boss tells you to do something, what do you do? or you grumble and complain and you go looking for a new boss, <laughs> right? I know a lot of you have been in the military, right? Okay, somebody a rank above you tells you what to do. What do you do? do, it. do you only do it if you respect that person? Do you only do it if they're a great servant leader? No, those things, those are helpful if you can have that, but you do it because they have the power and authority that you have to submit to. Okay? But there's another kind of submission. And that's what is mostly being talked about here in this passage. And that's the submission of your own desires and wants and needs for the benefit of the other person. That you put aside what you want in order to, catch this because they fit together, be a servant leader of someone else. So as a leader, you are actually submitting something of yourself to that other person for their benefit. And that's the kind of submission that Paul's talking about here. When it especially comes to husbands and fathers. Because are you the authority in the home? Yeah, there's a certain aspect in which he talks about that kind of leadership. You know, that the, the husband is the head of the wife. Okay, great. But then what's he tell us to do? Lay down your life and die for them. He doesn't say order them around. That's what we want to do because that's easier. <laughs> you have to do what I said because I said so, because I'm the boss. 
You know, that works for a little while with kids till they become teenagers. That might work for a little while with your wife until you become single. Okay? Yeah. What we're talking about is servant leadership that says, what I would prefer for myself, I'm going to sacrifice that. I'm going to set that aside for the sake of someone else who God has called me to lead. And that's what I mean by submission here. And I think that's what Paul is talking about. I should have brought this slide up too. There you go. Servant leadership is submitting your needs and wants to the needs of those you lead. Submitting your needs and wants to the needs of those you lead. Anybody ever heard of uh, General James Mattis? If you have not read or listened to the audiobook, Call Sign Chaos, it is a must read. Absolute must. Okay? Uh, Mattis was a lifelong Marine Corps general. Uh, his, his latest gig was, for the first two years, was Trump's Secretary of Defense. Okay? Uh, he, he resigned from that. Uh, he wrote a book. Give him a lot of credit. He did not write a tell-all book you know, about the current president. He wrote a tell-all book about everybody before, <laughs> leading up in a sense. But Mattis, uh, talk about someone who submitted his needs and wants and desires to those he was going to lead and serve. Okay? He made a commitment early in his life to never get married. You know why? Because he realized if he was going to be the right kind of Marine Corps officer who was able to give himself completely and totally to his men, that he could not be distracted by a family. Sounds like something the Apostle Paul said about ministry. That, hey, if you're able to and be single and do ministry for the Lord, that's great because then you're not distracted by a family and give yourself totally to it. Then Paul also said, look, like if you get... Can I say horny? Yeah, okay. It's a bunch of guys. Too late. Too late. That's, I, I say stuff like that in church too. Our guys know this. <laughs> he says, if you, know, if you can't control yourself physically, then get married and do what ministry you can. Mattis said, you know what? I can never be the kind of general, that I, the kind of officer that I need to be for my men if I'm married. And it played itself out in one of the most famous stories about him submitting himself to someone who was way below him in rank. At the time, he was a colonel. It was Christmas Day. There was a young lieutenant who was supposed to be the officer of the day. And he had a family. So Mattis told that guy, go home and be with your family. I will take your duty shift. So he's a colonel. For some reason, the general of, of, of that division comes in, showing up, probably wanting to like, catch whoever the young lieutenant is that's supposed to be on duty, doing something wrong. And he walks in and there's a sergeant there and he says, who's the officer of the day? He said, Colonel Mattis. He said, no, no, no. Who's the officer of the day? Colonel Mattis. No, you don't understand, son. Who slept in that bunk cot right there? Colonel Mattis. With that, Mattis walked in with whatever ceremonial sword he had to wear for being officer of the day. And the general looked at him and said, what are you doing here? He said, my officer who was supposed to be on duty today is a young lieutenant. He's got a family. He's got kids. He should be home with his kids today. So I took his duty. That is submitting yourself for the benefit of those you lead. Saying, I don't need to have Christmas Day. Even if I wanted to have, you know what? I'll give that up for their sake. And that's the kind of stuff that he did throughout his career. And one of the reasons why the men who serve for him absolutely adore him because he submitted himself to their needs. And that's what Jesus is saying to us here about how we lead our families in that way. All right, so how do you submit to your wife? Okay. Let, me, let me give you some, well first, Paul gives the example. He says, you know, that submission to your wife looks like this. Die. Die to yourself. Like Jesus died for the church. So this gets right to the heart of that thing of your wants and desires need to be superseded by the needs of your wife and your family. How's this play out? I've seen this happen so many times. A guy's climbing the career ladder. He's making his move up. 
He gets the opportunity for a big, huge promotion that means a move way across the country, away from, from family, friends, the church that the kids are a part of and growing in and all that sort of thing. And it's just like, there's no question. Oh yeah, we're making this move because that's what you do. Because my career is so important. And the family gets yanked out of a setting where the kids are growing in Christ. The wife has family and friends around her for support and encouragement while he's off traveling, doing his job all the time anyway. They move. All of a sudden, you know, they're in the midst of not knowing anybody, not having any roots, no connections, and he's still off doing his thing. And five, six, eight, ten years later, whatever it's going to be, I'm getting a phone call. They split up. Why? Why? Because he was chasing his career. And his family started just going to pieces. If your mindset is, I need to set aside my needs and wants and desires to make sure my family is well cared for. You might, in some of those situations, say, you know what? My family needs to be here. What's good for them right now is this place where we are. And the move, while it might be financially better, while, while it might advance my career, I'm pretty sure it's going to cause my family to suffer. Very often, guys never even ask that question. Never even think about it. It's just the assumption. Oh, this is the thing you do. The assumption of the thing you do should be, Lord, how do I die? Lay down my life for the sake of my family. Yeah. But the world says, no, it's about you. It's about you having your needs and wants met. Jesus said, it's about you meeting the needs and wants of others, submitting to one another, sacrificing for one another, laying down your life for one another. And he says there's a reason behind this. What Jesus does, the reason he dies for the church is so that he can cause the church to flourish and be beautiful and awesome and perfect and glorious and to, to be everything that it could possibly be. Why are you supposed to lay down your life for your wife? So that she can become beautiful and glorious and awesome and perfect and everything that God could ever want her to be. There's a sense in which what you need to be doing in the relationships with, with your wife and with your kids is just saying, how can I help them become the person that God wants them to be? You know, if I was to ask you, what, what spiritual gifts does your wife have? I'd, I'd, be, I'd be amazing to see how many of you would actually know. Because you should know that. You should know what your wife's spiritual gift is. You know why? So you can help her develop that in Christ. Because that's part of your job so that she becomes the Christian that God wants her to be. Now it might mean that you've got to take away time from something you want to do in order to help and serve her. You are submitting yourself to her. Now I'm not talking about final decision making within the family. My wife will be the first one to tell you that, that, that if push comes to shove, I've got to make the final decision on something in the family. We try to do stuff together, but if I come down and say, you know, I think we have to do this. She is very willing to go along with that for this reason. She knows that all along the way, I've been saying, what do I need to do for you? What do I need to do for our family? What do I need to do for us together to grow? And not what's for me, what's for my career, where am I? She knows that if I end up making a decision that she has to say, you know what? I'm gonna submit to that. She knows I'm making that decision in her best interest and our family's best interest. If all I'm doing all along the way is saying on every decision, no, you got to do what I want to do. You got to do what I want to do. You got to do what I want to do. Then when it comes to those really hard ones, they're going to be painful for her. Man, that's going to be tough because all she's thinking is he just wants to do his own thing because he's never demonstrated the willingness to sacrifice for us along the way. So it, it helps in those decisions later on. Um, so how do you submit to your wife? The same way Christ submitted to his bride by dying for her. Dying to your own needs and desires and wants for their sake. You know, now one of the things that people are going to ask, well, what about me? Well, when this works well, guess what's happening? She's dying for you. And she's willing to. Why? Because she knows that you die for her. She's willing to say, okay, I, I'll, I'll go with what you want. I'll go with what you think because I trust you. Because I know you care about us, about the family. All right. 
Time is flying here. All right, moving on. How do you submit to your kids? This one gets a little trickier, okay? Because with your kids, you know, there are times where you just have to be the one in authority. And it just has to be because I said so. When I see parents trying to reason with a four-year-old, <laughs> have you lost your mind? There's no reasoning with a four-year-old. It doesn't work. It just has to be, no, you have to do this. Why? For their own safety. And because their brain isn't going to be fully developed for another 20 years. Okay? Yeah, it's really not until you hit like 24 that your brain's fully formed. Okay? Which explains so much. <laughs> Even just looking around the room, it explains so much. <laughs> So at some point, when they are younger, up through like the, the elementary school years, you are the cop. You do what I said. Here's, where, here's where, where parents, and where fathers in particular, can really struggle. Because you, you get the cop thing. Yeah, we like that. But when they start hitting those teenage years, you're no longer the cop. You're the coach. Because now you have to start helping them to understand how and why you want them to do what they do. You know, I coached high school football for 20 years between being in Pittsburgh and here in Oviedo. And one of the things that, that, that I loved about coaching is that the best coaches are actually teachers, okay? One of the best coaches ever in the history of football was a guy named Chuck Knoll, okay? So you know that name, Hall of Fame coach, Pittsburgh Steelers four-time 70s Super Bowl champion. <laughs> Beat the Los Angeles Rams in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I love you, Pete. I, I love you too. And, and I'm just helping you to submit for this. For this. <laughs> Chuck Knoll was not a rah-rah guy on the sidelines at all. But what was said about him all the time was he was a teacher. And I knew guys who played for him and coached with him. And that's what they all said. Think about some of the great teachers, the great coaches throughout history that you can think about. Shula. Amen. He wasn't jumping up and down and screaming on the sidelines. In fact, you had to like take a pulse, you know? But he was a teacher. Landry, teacher. Dabo. <laughs> Look up, just Google why Dabo is called Dabo. Dabo Sweeney, it's, a, it's, it's great. And if you're from Alabama, it'll make perfect sense. Okay, I'll just leave that at that. All right, but going all the way back, going back to Lombardi, he would start every training camp holding up a football and saying, what? Gentlemen, this is a football. We're gonna start from the basics and teach. So at some point you have to start teaching your kids. Why? Because eventually you're not gonna be there and they need to know why things are the way they are so they can make the decisions. If all they've done is listen to you every time and just done what you've said, eventually you're gone. And now what? You need to equip them to be able to be men and women for the kingdom who are wise and can make good decisions. So you're a cop, you're a coach, then, and this is the role that, that my wife and I are in now, eventually you become the consultant. Okay? Now here's the thing about a consultant. You do not consult until you're invited in to consult. Okay? But if you have built the relationship along the way, guess what happens? You get invited in to consult. Hey dad, how do I do this? Hey, we're having this struggle with, with, with one of your grandsons. <laughs> it's amazing how that happens. You know? So they ask because the relationship's already there. But it's also meant that along the way, you've got to do the same thing that you've done with your wife. You've got to say, hey, you know what? I want to go do this thing, but what my kid needs me for this. And you've got to make sure, here's something I saw again with coaching. I saw so many dads trying to relive their, what they thought were their glory days that probably really didn't even exist through their kid. And so they force their kid into being something that the kid doesn't want to be. We've got three sons. They are as different as night and day and I don't know what, okay? The first one was born. They handed him to us. I'm holding him. He's looking up at me and he's going, la, la. 
He's still like that today. <laughs> right? He's just chill. It's just okay. No problem. We thought, man, we know how to make babies. You know? Second one was born. And this was when they still kept the babies in the nursery and only brought them in to feed. So I'm in the room with Barb and we could hear the, from the nursery down the hall, our doors closed, the nursery's door closed and we hear this kid. <laughs> Barb looks at me and says, oh, that poor mother. <laughs> yeah, you know it's coming. They open the nursery room doors, it's even louder. We start hearing it coming down the hall. You know, it's that, it's that Doppler effect. You know, the whole thing, right? They open the door. They bring him in, and my wife is laying in bed. She looks at the nurse and says, oh, that's not my baby. My babies don't cry like that. <laughs> nurse looks at the wristband, looks at the wristband. Oh, sugar, this one's yours. <laughs> <laughs> and he has been that way ever since. He is just attacking life. You know, never stops, always on the go, always doing something. Okay. The third one, we thought, well, okay, he'll be like somewhere in the middle. No, he's like a different point on the triangle because he's got uniqueness all his own, right? My, my youngest son, when he was a senior at Oviedo High School, was the president of the Asian Club. <laughs> my wife's father is a McGuire, her mother's an O'Connell, my mother's a Fitzwilliam, we're like three quarters Irish, my dad was Croatian. Nobody ever went to Asia, okay? But he loved all things Asian culture. He's going off to college. I'm like, well, what do you want to study? Well, I want to be an Asian studies major and learn Mandarin Chinese. Okay, we'll see how this goes. Now, I could have put my foot down and said, no way. How are you going to ever get a job doing that? Well, he did get a job. He's a project manager on the construction of the new airport, the International Terminal, okay? I don't think that has anything to do with it. He's not using his degree at all, but he's got a great job doing something else that he's gifted at because he was also a 3D artist. He understands space and structure and form of things, and we let him develop that as well by encouraging that. Only one of our kids is an athlete. Now, guess which one? The middle one, you know, went to States as a wrestler for Oviedo because you're not stopping him. His younger brother, the one who was the president of the Asian club, wrestled for one year at Oviedo, his freshman year, because his brother was a senior. And he just wanted to hang out with his brother. Doesn't have a competitive bone in his body, but he did it so he could hang out with his brother. When he said at the end of his freshman year, well, I'm done doing that, great. I'm tired of sitting on bleachers anyway all weekend long. Right? So my point in all this is that, that you, you as, as, as a person in leading your family, as a man leading your family, your job is to figure out who has God made them to be and do everything you can to help them develop that. That's called discipleship. You know, so many of you do a great job discipling some other guy and not your family. And sometimes we, f we miss what it means to disciple your family. We think, oh, I, I have to do these regimented things with them. No, you need to help them develop as someone who loves God and is using their gifts for, God, for God's glory to change the world. But that means knowing who they are, where they are, where they're starting from, and helping them, as Paul talked about with wives, to develop and grow. And when he talked about what he said to the fathers with their children, he says, don't exasperate your children. Right? What does that mean? That means when you are just ticked and you want to scream and yell at them for something. Submit that. Die to that. Set that aside. Because all you're going to do is frustrate them. Don't keep trying to force them to be something they weren't made to be because that's what you wish you were. You're just going to exasperate them. You're just going to drive them away. It's all about setting those emotions aside, those needs and wants of your own for their sake and for their benefit. So, submit to their development as followers of Christ who will change the world. That's how you, that's how you submit, lead, servant lead your kids. And so often when you read 
the idea of us submitting to one another in Scripture, it's coming with the idea of being like Christ, who's willing to die for others, and being a servant leader who sets aside what you want for the sake of those who you are called to lead. Once in a while, you're going to have to just make the authoritative call and say, that's how it is. But you can do that so much better if all along the way, you've taken their lives, their relationship with Christ into consideration and they know that you've been willing to sacrifice for them time and time again. And now that you're calling for this, they become much more willing to submit and sacrifice for you. All right. Talk about it. Dr. Dan Lasich, you brought it again. I really appreciated that. I loved it. Listen, yeah, give him a round. <laughs> Forge is pro-pastor, pro-local church. We have great pastors that come here, great local churches represented. I love how you walked through the text of Scripture. Uh, men, we need good Bible teaching and that was a strong point of this. But he gave us an outline, I, personal illustrations. But I love the cop, coach, and consultant. Did you all get that? If you didn't get that, you lost, you lost a great model for a man's development of life. And I just want to reinforce that. That that's important for us to understand. And where most of us make, make mistakes is we do understand somewhat of the cop. But we don't somehow make the transition to coach. And even fewer get to consultant. You spoke to me. Dan? Full disclosure, my wife taught me that. <laughs> I love that. Full disclosure, his wife taught him that. Hey, listen, my wife has taught me stuff that ah, our wives teach us, right? We are not anti-women. We're pro-women. We are better. Usually we marry up. And so the reality is, guys, that, but, but, that, but that is a tool. We talk about temperaments. Understanding your temperament is a great tool. Understanding the love languages, that is a great tool for marriage. This is an important tool that every man has to have in his toolkit. Uh, and this is where most of us fail because we don't make the transitions from cop to coach to consultant. And, and, and men, I want to leave with this. You are absolutely crucial. You know that, don't you? As a father, uh, as, a, as, a, as a husband, as a leader in the community, you might not have any kids. As a grandfather, God has placed us men as crucial. That's why we're expending time, energy, effort doing what we're doing with Forge. Because men are crucial at the very forefront of what God is doing to advance his kingdom. Don't you ever forget it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message we heard today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the messenger that gave it to us today. And as my brothers and I leave here, I pray that you would undo the work of the evil one who always wants to uh, tell us we're not important. And we pray that as we walk out of here today, we would remember that because of you, Lord Jesus, we are the deeply beloved, redeemed sons of the Most High God. Help us to see how important we are. And Lord God, that you would use us in, in our key roles. May we pass on the truth, truths that we've learned today and give us your grace as we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go get them. Go get them.